Right. Um, let's do some housekeeping before we begin. So, there's no seminar tomorrow. It's just a workshop for projects. So, if you have any project related issues whatsoever, come and see me tomorrow in the seminar times. I'll be in the room, I won't be in my office. So, please feel free to come along and discuss whatever issues you've got. So I'm mindful you've got to submit in nine days' time. Uh, next week, the lecture next week will be obviously interesting and stimulating material, but I don't think it, it's a deliberate one. It's something which people don't usually talk about in projects at all, so it's kind of an odd one which I use to mark time. I'll go over some of the more fundamental points of the module in the context of social media and protest movements. So, the best will in the world. I don't expect to see many people next week at this time because it's like three days before your projects are due in. Most people take that time, so fine. But the seminars next week are much more important than the lecture, and they're much more important than any seminar that's been before because I use the seminars to go through assignment two and give you a plan of exactly what I want you to do if you do all the things I tell you to do in the seminar, you can't fail to get less than 70% for assignment two. So, and this has been proven. I have facts, I have tables, I have graphs that prove this shit. People who came to the seminars last year got over 70% for assignment two. People who didn't, average mark was about 60, 58, something like that. So, if you want to get first, I mean, you might not want to. But it looks better for me if you do, right? It looks a lot better for me. If I'm going for promotion or something like that, I can point and say, look at that shit there. That's fucking sweet. So, if you are interested in getting me a promotion at some point, and to have a good degree, secondary to me, I don't give a shit about a degree. You know, it's not important to me. But, um, you know, it's, if you want to get a good degree, then seminars next Tuesday are really important, okay? I will put the PowerPoint that I use for the seminars up on the canvas. I'm happy to talk to people if they can't make it to the seminars, but it's better if you're there. So, is there anything else I need to talk about? No, so we've got tomorrow covered, the next week covered, that's about it, right? Because then you submit on Thursday, you hopefully, if you submit on Thursday and you haven't got extenuating circumstances, I'm hoping to have your marks back with you by the following Tuesday which would be Tuesday the 26th, because I'm mindful that you need marks and feedback to get on with assignment two for this module. So I'm, gonna tr I'm basically going to blitz Friday, Monday, Tuesday. I don't work on weekends because of the life. Um, do all that, hopefully, and I'll send an email to everyone when the marks are released, so you will know. And you can crack on straight away with doing assignment two, then, which should give you six weeks, I think. To get the second assignment done, so plenty of time. We will have one lecture after Easter, <coughs> which is going to be really important <coughs> because if you come to the seminars next week, you'll realise why the lecture after Easter is really important in terms of the conclusions I want you to talk about in assignment two. I'm basically then going to cut the course short, one week short. I'm going to drop one lecture because I very much don't. Will uh, scrub that. It's about like blue sky and mastodon and all these social networks. You can see that face? That face is exactly right. Nobody knows about them. So. Okay, so this week is only going to be a half lecture because we will go up to what, 3 o'clock and then. Just finish. Stop. I'll be here if, again if you want advice on your projects and what have you. That's the point of doing a half lecture today, is to give you some time and space to talk about any issues that you've got, but hopefully there won't be any. So, somebody's been messing around with the settings on the display in this group, so I can't actually display the thing that I wanted to show, which was the survey that you did for, well, some of you did for dating apps. What I can tell you from the survey is 50% uh, of people have used Tinder at some point. That's a depressing fucking statistic, that, right in itself. Um, 
and 34% have used Hinge. Only 35% said they've never used a dating app at all. So, so to the 35% of people in the room who've never used a dating app, I have a question. How do you meet people? It's a genuine question. I want, I want advice. Okay? So I've met people through friends. Through friends. This is your friends network. Are friends... Are your friends normal? <laughs> Ish. Are your friends reliable? Kind of. Kind of. I think it's a very fraud thing. If I think about my friend. William Merrin's one of my friends. I'm not dating anyone who knows him. That's... <laughs> 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 I'm not doing that. Um, okay, so there's friend networks and so on. Any other dating tips? Social fags. Do what? Uh, the, uh, all society. You know, yeah. Society? Yeah, I'm a bit of society. Fuck that. Yeah. I live in society, I'm not doing that. Do you mean like, you know, societies you join? Yes, yes. Okay, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I don't want to go out with anyone who's into the same stuff as me. That, no. Um, okay, but there's that option. Any other options here? Through the Helen. Through pe oh. Hell no! <laughs> Gee, I can't do anything worse! No. God, I suppose in a lot of cultures around the world that is a very common thing that happens, but I've met my parents, there's no fucking way. Um, I can't think of anything worse to be honest. Um, community, I think. What do you mean? Yeah, behind China we have a community, so I have all of the people living in the community, <coughs> area, so we pay to so we come in everyone. Um, um, so like local ties you have? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, this, this is kind of a thing in society, right? You know, people, I'm sure you're either one of these people or you know somebody who um, is still seeing somebody they met at school. Yeah? You guys see a few nods of recognition here. I mean, that might be yourself as well, and fair play to you if you are. It, it always weirds me out that. <clears throat> so you didn't choose to be in that school. You, know, you were born at a particular time, which you had no choice in, and then your family decided to live in a particular location, which you had no choice in. So you were placed with a group of people that you had absolutely no say in being in interpersonal relationships with any point. And then you, somebody makes a decision like, I'm going to stay with one of these fucking random yahoos for the rest of my life, that's going to be it. It's like, it's something bigger than that, you know? So, you know, communities and, I mean, without saying too much about the area that I'm from, there is no, absolutely no fucking way on earth I would ever copulate with some of the specimens that come from the village that I come from. Okay, I am probably related to most of them, so the offspring would be hideous uh, and retarded in the extreme. So that you know, community doesn't do it for me. So what else can I do? By the way, I, I don't need dating advice of this kind because I'm in a relationship. But let's assume that I'm not for a moment. <laughs> Disclaimer in case my partner ever watches this lecture. Um, what else can I do? In a bar? Yeah. Well, do you know what? When I was younger, yeah, that was how things were done. You got hideously drunk and then latched on to the nearest person who would not be repulsed by you in an in, in immediate fashion. Yeah. Does that still happen? Do people still go to bars to cop off? Oh my god, I can't think of anything worse than I go to bars, you know, I go I go to Jack Murphy's in the Uplands, I see the people walking in there. You couldn't there's not enough money in the world for me to get into a relationship with most of the people who walk in that bar, you know? Is you know the question, would you do this for a million? I was like, no. There's not enough millions to cop off with anyone who goes to Jack Murphy's. Um and catch something, quite frankly. So, okay, there's that. Well, these are all potential options, but overwhelmingly, since around about 2010, the most commonly used, it's not the exclusively used, but the most commonly used method of people meeting a new romantic attachment has been via Apple. 
applications of some kind or another. And structurally, dating apps are social media. They're social media because we are asked to make a visual representation of ourselves, in particular of some kind, and indeed, often for verification purposes, that has to be an accurate image of yourself. So you are asked to self-represent or self-present in the sort of Goffman way of thinking about things. You're asked to create a profile which lists interests and so on. And then you are asked to create a network with other users on that application for a specific purpose. Therefore, that is structurally the same as making a Facebook account, a Twitter account, an Instagram account, etc. You are asked to do the same thing effectively. The purpose of doing so is different. Maybe. I don't know, maybe people go on Instagram to pop off with others. But that actually is more common than one might think. And it's very, very creepy off them as well. But at least this one is explicit. This is a form of social media, right? So, in terms of social media here, we have social media impacting on, firstly, the idea of intimacy. The social media becomes a mediator in intimate, in intimate relationships, or at, at least the formation of intimate relationships. And because of that, the impact of social media here is on social cohesion, because to form an intimate relationship with one another before the age of social media required things like community, that you would rely upon community ties in order to meet people. Therefore, you needed to be part of a cohesive community yourself in order to make those links to other people. This disintermediates social cohesion. You need no links with the other people on those applications, apart from having an account at the same time as them, and broadly matching a set of parameters in which they fit. And even those parameters are very nebulous on dating apps as well. You might put in an age range on, I don't know, 18 to 26. You might get people way outside that, and way outside the range of people that you're looking at as well. Because, does anyone actually go on the Swansea University social media sites? Like Instagram, or follow Swansea University social media. You do? Yes. A couple of you. Have anyone seen the video that I did about this? Yeah, I see. Yeah. Right. If you want a one minute explanation of what happens, it's on the Swansea University's Instagram account, where um, a, former, a former media student who did this module a couple of years ago, Victoria Farrell, uh, she made a video um, of me talking about this very thing. So, so very briefly today, and it is brief because this lecture really consolidates a lot of the things I've already talked about in the module anyway, but I'm just concretizing it in a different way. I'm going to look at how people have argued that social media has caused a decline in social cohesion. That's a little element of new stuff, and why there's been a rise, therefore, in the use of dating applications. Well, the effects of dating apps in terms of overall culture of intimacy and how dating apps work as an extension of social media culture itself. If we accept that social media culture is a culture which exploits individuals in society for data in order for money to be made, how does this work? Now, I'll start then with the conclusion that I draw in that little video, which you can go and check out. In that video, what I talk about is one very simple. Dating apps are not meant to make you find someone. The whole purpose of a dating app is not for you to find somebody to be in a relationship with. It's, in fact, the opposite. The point of dating apps is to make sure that you don't find somebody to be with. Can anyone tell me why? Why would a dating app make you fail? And what happens if you stop using it? <coughs> and when what happens? But what happens to the company? Can you, now, can you imagine if Tinder was effective? And like, everyone who went on Tinder got in a relationship. Well, it would fucking fail instantly. 
this most stupid business idea I've ever had. It's like making an everlasting light bulb. <laughs> Imagine you went to the shop and you bought a light bulb and it was never going to end. What's the fucking point in that? The business model of the company is completely fucked. The whole point of light bulbs and making light bulbs is they're going to blow up so you have to buy new ones. That's the business model of that industry, right? Your light bulb is going to end at some point, so you have to buy new ones. If you never have to buy a new one, well, everyone's bought a light bulb now. Oh, we may as well pack up and go home. It's the same principle with dating apps. If everyone was successful in the first couple of days of logging on, like, we haven't got any customers. Well, they haven't got any customers because the customers are the advertisers who pay for that platform, who pay for the data that you contribute to them. Now, if everyone got, got lucky, then there is no <laughs> business model at all. You have no more users to contribute data. So the entire point of Tinder is for you to not meet somebody good. So the algorithms that work on these applications, you know, you type in all your likes and dislikes and your personality traits and what you're looking for as a per in a person. So you build an image of somebody who would be ideal for you and then they give you complete shitbacks. Over and over again you get the worst of humanity presented to you. You get every ugly and scrub from here to Cardiff lining up on your social, on your dating app, and you're like, you can't swipe left fast enough on this shit, right? Because these people are losers. It's deliberate. That's the whole point. You're given all the bad stuff in order to keep you on the application. Because if you left, there's no money. So the whole point of dating apps is for you to fail to find a relationship. There's no point. They don't want you to succeed. They want to keep you unhappy, alone, and future, thinking of a future where you have to have at least five cats. That is the whole point of these applications. Unless you pay. And then when you pay, you will see the experience transform at all, because they've got the money off you now. They don't have to rely on you any further. You pay, you pay a subscription to them, things will be better. Going on anything for free is destined to make you sad, lonely, unhappy, and questioning your existence, and questioning whether there are any other normal human beings available on this planet. So, you have a question. Yeah, so they left our drug, so that people are addicted into the dating app, and then people can keep using it, and people keep still wishing, and then people keep paying the money. Well, and I think one, I'm going to get into why social, the why dating apps in particular are physically addictive in a little while, because there's something about the interface of dating apps that make them incredibly addictive. And it's this, that gesture, is a physically addictive thing. The ability to dismiss people, just like that. Oh, it's so powerful. It's like, ooh, uh, oh, funny eye. Uh, no, uh, mustache. No, it, you know, it, it, it is a powerful thing. So, best book written about <coughs> this topic is this one, The New Laws of Love by Marie Bergstrom. It came out in 2021. And, as Marie argues in this book, the, media, uh, the mediation of dating via applications has led to what she calls a privatization of intimacy. So that entire act of creating intimate relationships has been privatized for profit. Um, and it can be read in two ways. So firstly, the platformization of intimacy through applications has led to, predictably, data mining and data processing of users for profit. Every time you sign up for an application, you immediately become part of the data churn. These companies link heavily to other companies, so they will have relationships with Meta, with Google, etc., to add to your data profile. Did you know that there's basically only two companies in dating apps that they own more? But like Tinder and Hinge are basically the same. Basically the same company. Probably use two apps. Probably two apps. Why use one app so people can use two apps? Well, my point is that it doesn't matter which app you use. It's the same company that owns them. 
So you might think, all right, I'm not going to use Tinder because they're evil and data people. Well, guess what? They own the other one too. So it's like, it's like saying, oh, I don't go on Facebook because they're horrible. I go on Instagram. The same company. It's, it's like, you know, this like two puppets here. Good, bad, but it's the same guy holding the two puppets. Yeah. So predictably, um, algorithmic so governance comes into this. So you might ask whether a dating algorithm may not be calibrated for you to find the perfect match. It is not calibrated to find you the perfect match. What the algorithms are calibrated to do is keep you just enough interested to keep on using the application. And that's it. So, like other applications on social media, we talked about this in the context of TikTok and Instagram in the past. Any boredom on TikTok, for example, you get three, four videos, shit, 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 swipe, 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 bang, something nice. <coughs> shit, 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 bang, something nice. To keep that spiking of the dopamine receptors going, what dating apps do is where they will deliberately sort the algorithms so you get sort of not a hope, not a hope, not a hope, not a hope, ooh, promising. Not a hope, not a hope, not a hope, not a hope, promising. Um, so we have already, if you like, the gamification of dating in that way. Now, second, Bergen's, Bergen's second main point is that dating is now seen as a private, compartmentalized activity that's carried out in a separate sphere from the rest of our lives. And I think this is the most significant point. First point is kind of obvious. When you think of these social media apps, it makes sense that that happens. But this is the more important point. Dating used to be a public activity. Now, when I was your age, how did I manage to go on dates? Well, it was pretty much like described. Go to a bar or a nightclub, get hideously drunk, and try to kick on women. You might think, oh my god, maybe you saw me. It's like, yes, that is true. <coughs> but it was not unusual. That was how things were done. That's how everyone did it, right? That behavior is now unusual. If I were single, I could not think of a worse thing to do than to go up to talk to a woman in a pub. I just wouldn't have to. No way. Never do it. I'd be like, are you with some wrongity? Are you a fucking serial killer? Only like serial killers and, you know, sort of the mentally deranged go and talk to strangers in pubs. This, this is not done then. This is not something I can do. I can't, you know, I'm trying to. I'm trying, I'm not doing very well, but I'm trying to be a respectable member of a community here, of a, you know, a culture. I can't just go and talk to random women in bars, that'd be fucking awful. But that's how things largely used to do. School networks, work networks, etc. Those would be the core ways that people would do this. Now, Bergstrom's argument is that thanks to dating apps, that act of courtship has been taken away from social activities, and instead, dating place takes place in its own space now, the space of the dating applications. <clears throat> that increasingly, our search for intimacy and intimate partners takes place in this like this third space, private, public, dating apps in the middle. And that, you know, COVID arguably accelerated that as well. So, I mean, I can concretize this, you know, let's say one of you goes on a date with somebody who's on this course, and it's a hideous fucking fail. You know, I don't know what happens, you throw up on them or something, you know, or, you know, there's something unpleasant that happened, you end up bottling them, or, you know, anything that could happen, normal things that happen on dates, right? I've never bought them okay, but I'll look at The sick one else the best. Um, would you be in shame for the rest of your existence if something bad happened on a day and you were in the class with that person for the rest of your university? I think you would. And in an age of social anxiety, <laughs> that's going to be fucking terrible, right? So people are less and less inclined 
to use the kind of networks that would have been utilized in the past. It would be shaming beyond belief to have to see that person for the next two years. That's no good. So you don't want to do that. So for Bergstrom, the in-apps create what we call a liminal space for intimacy, quite apart from other spheres of everyday life. Only once the relationship is solidified does the separate space collapse. Basically, a liminal space like that is a space which is created for a particular activity. And what Bergstrom's argument is, is we keep dating separate from everything else until we know it's going well. Then it can fold back into the structures of everyday life. But until we reach that point, it takes place in this mediated space with applications, with you know, messaging applications and so on as well, which augment this. But we keep the intimate away from our public lives, we've got work, uni, whatever, and our private lives until we're satisfied that it can fit into those spaces. So that is the key thing that dating apps is, have done is create an entirely separate space for the formation of intimate relationships. And when we put it like that, that is incredibly weak. Because the purpose of having an intimate relationship is to share your life with somebody in some way. And basically our rationale for doing that is now, I'm gonna keep everything separate from my life in order to share my life with somebody. It doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense when we stress it in those terms. So for Bergstrom, I mean, what I would say is this book isn't negative about dating apps. She's kind of ambivalent about them, really, Marie Bergstrom, I'd say. She doesn't think these things are necessarily good, but she's not criticising people for using them, for one, and she's not that critical of the results that can come from dating apps. Some people find you know, happiness on some people find people they really like. But some people are really happy with the people. According to that survey, 15% of people are in a relationship with somebody they met. Through the dating app. That's lovely. If you're in a nice relationship with somebody that you met on a date app, oh, that's a result as far as I'm concerned. You know, if you're in a happy relationship with somebody, does it matter how you got there? I'm not that convinced at the end of the day if it did matter. As long as you're happy with that person, that's fine. But what Bergstrom is concerned about is these two points. Because we have one which feeds this business model of social media, and we have the other, which is much more substantial, I think, that we've created a way of establishing intimacy which is divorced from everyday life, not connected to it. And because of that, when we try to connect intimate relationships into our lives, they very often fail because they've been established in a space in which those things didn't matter. And that's why it's problematic, according to Bergstrom. Very often we will meet people through dating apps, and when we actually try to integrate that relationship into everything else, it falls apart because it wasn't founded in everything else. Therefore, the mediatization of dating does have some problematic aspects to it. Now, this line of thinking isn't new. The first, I mean, there's been other theorists who've thought about this in the past, but I think the most substantial contribution to this is Sherry Turkle's book from 2011. Now, I can't believe that book is that old. Uh, 13 years ago, God, I was reading that when I was getting ready to submit my PhD. I was a young man. I wasn't beaten by life at that point. I had different colour, not hair. I had, like, gingery brown hair. What was going on? Sherry Turkle's Alone Together, as you can tell from the title, poses a paradox. What Turkle argues in this book is that although social media gives us the feeling of being together with others, we are perpetually alone. Because our communication is always at a distance, it's always mediated by the technology we use. Therefore, we're not really with people we've just created the illusion of being with people. So Turkle's focus on it is uh, technology changes the way we communicate. Unsurprisingly, Sherry Turkle is a feminist scholar. 
Um, now, what she argues here is that organic and authentic interactions have become degraded through digital media use and constant exposure to meaningless interactions with AI. Communication is organized by algorithm and is inauthentic. We basically pay little attention to one another, have shallow relationships, and our reliance on constantly looking to others on social media, our friends or connections, to validate us means that we don't have any self-reflection, leading to less personal independence. What Turkle says is a major paradox of play in all of digital society. We communicate more, but we actually feel less because of that. We're continually communicating, we're continually on the screens, we're continually talking to others or communicating with others, but because of that, everything becomes shallower, not deeper. And this reflects very much on dating apps as well. Although Turtle was writing this book before dating apps blew, which was really about 2012 when they became huge. Turtle's points here are equally valid. If you think about this, we, how do you establish intimate relationships? You get to know somebody. If our way of getting to know somebody is via this kind of technology, where we're continually being organized by algorithm, having uh, you know shallow, meaningless sort of interactions with people in a mediated space, that intimate relationship itself is going to lack a lot of the properties of actual intimacy. And because of that, our definition as individuals of what the intimate is will change from being something which is deep, meaningful, personal, into something which is less than that. So our very understanding of what it is to be intimate with others is being transformed by the technology around us. Hence it being in a clear with this idea because the technology is changing concepts in society. Now, Turkle's arguments here are more at the very pessimistic end of um, analysis of social media, but that doesn't mean she's not correct. Right? She makes a number of very valid points about it. What I would say about Sherry Turkle's work is that it applies to some. It doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, but it certainly has some application. So Turkle's arguments in Alone Together are something we should think about, not just in the context of um, dating apps, but also social media in general. I want to focus on Tinder because it's fucking funny. This is the short answer to it. Tinder is like a bin fire of hilarious proportions. Female friends that I speak to who have used or what are using Tinder you got to think, okay, this is a little bit out of your range, guys. If you do you use Tinder, you might not be familiar with this stuff, because, obviously, it's a different generation, right? But, um, I mean, they hate it, for one. But they hate it for very specific reasons. There are a few different types of guy on Tinder of my age, apparently. There's one, the guy who never posts a picture of himself, only pictures of the groups that he's in. Right? So you can't tell who he is. So he could be the one who looks like a brick, but you just don't know. Then there's the guy who um, you know, has a fish. There's always some fucking guy who, I've never been fishing. I'm like, where are people going fishing? Well, where is this fishing activity? I don't see anyone fishing. What the fuck is going on? Then there's a guy who always has some pictures in front of his car. And I was like, I can't, I've never owned a good car. I don't give a fuck about cars, right? Cars like, get you from there to there. I don't give a shit, right? So I would never take my cars shitty. What do I care? <laughs> you know, so, but apparently men are really into cars. Um, what was the other one that was really bizarre? So I said this to me, I was like, no, there's not people like that in this, and there is. Oh yeah, apparently men over the age of like 35 can't take photos of themselves, so everything is from this angle. So like, nobody, don't ever take photos of yourself. You guys know, right? You don't take photos from under there, right? But apparently that's a big thing. Um, and of course, most of them are Kids as well, which is kind of impressive as well. So these are these are the insights that I've garnered about uh, this kind of stuff, and of course, sending pictures of genitalia is also <coughs> a fucking immediate thing apparently as well. Which, which if you're a man on a dating site, you don't actually experience because it doesn't come the other way. So it's a very very odd situation. 
So, like, based on a lot of the things, not actually my own experiences, but the people have told me about dating apps, I think Tinder looks like the end of Western civilization, quite frankly. A Wild West environment where people think they can do whatever the fuck they want and present themselves as some kind of feral hogs uh, in order to somehow establish an intimate relationship. Now, before we go any further, use very interesting set of statistics about this. These statistics come from last year. But we're going to have a bit of guess here. Okay? Listen very carefully to what I'm going to say. I'm interested in what do you think the average success rate for a man on Tinder is. Now, we'll define success like this. Success will be defined by the number of times that they match with a female. Okay? So that is success. Okay? If we think of it in terms of an average, we can think of it in terms of uh, perhaps a percentage. So we can go and say, for every hundred like swipes, swipes to the right, how many times do you think they get a reciprocal like, which would make a match? Okay? That's a success. I think in the context of Tinder, that, that would make equal to their success, right? Does anyone have any idea? Well, yeah, it, and I'm talking about basically all men on Tinder here, like, because it's the average. Does anyone have any ideas what the success rate for men is on Tinder? 50%. 50%. 50%. 5-0. 50%. 60%. 60%. Okay? We have a starting point. Five percent interest. Five percent, Connor. Two percent. Two percent. Two percent. Any others? No. Okay. So the actual success rate is zero point seven percent. That means that the average man on Tinder has to swipe on a hundred and seven people before he gets one like. Okay. Now. I haven't got a board to draw on you, which is a bit of crap. I mean, I can use that one over there. But I don't know if you guys will be able to see it very clearly. What we have on these applications is what is what's called a classic skewed distribution. So, I know you guys can't see this, sorry, but basically we have a distribution which looks like this. Actually, it's more pronounced than that. It would be like that, basically, right? So, in average, what you have is what we call a long tail distribution. You get a small number of men who have a lot of success on the application. Because they present themselves in a particular way, have a particular set of qualities, they get a lot of matches. That is a very small number. But they dominate those statistics, basically. So one guy might have a success rate of, say, 85%. Okay. But the vast majority of men have very little success on it. Wow. And in fact, there's a large proportion of men who never get matched on Tinder. Ever. Around about 15% of Tinder users who are male will never match. Zero. Zilch. Nada. There's a bit in the middle where, you know, I, 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 look, I, I'm not the best looking man in the world, right? But I do think we're in the past, so I'm my partner and I met. Um, I guess in a couple of weeks, I can't like, say, like, seven or eight matches, something like that. But then I'm quite judicious on it. I, I do tend to, like, I'm a bit of a fucking snob, it's like, didn't go to you, you fuck off. Don't be really a <coughs> fuck off. What soap opera's fun. You, you, know, I, you know, stuff like that, you know, like said, she would get put fucking hell. Uh, you know, so, yeah. You know, I'm a bit, mm. but there's a lot of men out there who would be like, swipe on everything, and never get anything back. Look at all you, look at the same time you're in Fuck up, because you know. <laughs> Don't be so pathetic, probably fucking face like a spade, like, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, um, so, they would even get some insight there that actually dating apps can have above and beyond the things I'm going to talk about, really significant problems for people 
in terms of self-esteem, they can be absolutely crippling in that patient. Um, now, what happens to women on the applications is almost a complete reversal. Women don't struggle for attention to paper applications at all because you have this long tail of men who are basically swapping them. I know it sounds awful in that, and I'm sure the women who are getting swiped have great individual quality, I'm not saying otherwise. But it, it's an inverse thing. And of course, there's a massive disparity between men and women on the applications as well. About 75% of the that use is male. So there's far fewer women on those. So you would actually expect a quite a big discrepancy between the number of people like female or male anyway because of the discrepancy of numbers in any case. But it does lead to very, very odd ways of thinking about yourself as a human being and how you have self-worth if you're on one of these applications and you sit there and you never, ever get even a single like, that must be pretty desultory. On the converse, if you are female and you get lots of attention on there, but it's all from shit lags, that must also have concurrent effects on you as an individual and your self-worth as well, I imagine. Difficult for me to say because I've never posed as a woman catfish on Tinder, although I have thought of doing this as an experiment quite a lot of times, I have never actually got around to doing it. So, Urban Dictionary, my favourite site for authoritative information, the Urban Dictionary. Um, top rated definition, dating app. Tinder is the McDonald's for sex. Why would it be like McDonald's? Because it's cheap. Because of what? Well, it's cheap. It's cheap. <laughs> Depends who you meet. <laughs> it's an interesting way of putting it. It's not that we like to use, but I kind of like that. Um, but McDonald's is standardised, right? You, you, you know what you're doing. It's, a, it's a, like a, uh, an assembly line for you. And I guess that idea consists with Tinder. It's like an assembly line for intimacy. Go on, set up your account. Set up your profile, and then it's that mechanical way of doing things. Which you can do. Now, what's, in pro what's really important about Tinder is to realise that it's massively integrated into the wider social media context. A lot of people will sign on to it by using a Facebook account or a Meta account, for example. So you can see the data integration there. A lot of people will take images from social media and put on. It's got integration with Instagram. It's got integration with. I think, uh, Spotify, I believe. So, you know, it's integrated into a lot of other things. So there's a lot, not just of data feeding, but also of social media feeding into the construction of profiles on it. That, in turn, sort of leads to, it tenders like a gateway to other social media to find out about people, basically. So all those things we've talked about, about self-presentation on social media, become factors in the dating environment as well. Now, the reason why I like Tinder as an example of this is that, that action. Other academics have studied this. We call it the swipe logic. Basically, intimacy itself is disrupted by the immediacy and acceleration provided by Tinder and other apps. In the past, in the golden sepia-toned wonderland that is the past, when nothing went wrong, everything was wonderful, and we all lived happy lives, of course, none of that existed, right? But in the past, at least, intimacy or the desire and the if you want to want to establish an intimate relationship with somebody, at least took some time. You know, obviously you would see somebody and think, okay, I'm attracted to that person. But also then you would have to converse with them. You know, you couldn't just sort of go up to them and say, right, you and me matched. That didn't, that, that, that didn't ever happen, okay? You know, you'd have to put a bit of effort in, at least. The argument here is that the very gesture of a swipe has accelerated how we consider other people as potential partners. We now look at that first image, the first image is the one that makes the impression. The other images on a profile, ah, useful, 
but it is that immediacy and primacy of the first image makes the impression that you have. And by the time we have looked at the first image, we have made the decision about whether we are going to swipe, swipe left or right on that first image. And because of that, we have accelerated the very process of establishing whether we want to be intimate with another person on the basis of that, because we know that our way to indicate that now is not to make contact with them, is not to say anything to them, is not to buy them a drink at the bar, is not to say how, you know, go up and say, oh, no, your outfit's really lovely, you know, I love what you've done with your hair, you know, did you watch football yesterday? That's why I never got very far from doing that, was always my mind, right? But um, instead of doing any of that now, it's just back. It's an immediate thing, which becomes automatic. You use these applications for long enough, you don't even think about what you're doing with the finger. It's literally a, sort of a disembodied action. You are no longer in control. You know, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. So, it was hilarious actually. I mean, I'm, I'm, don't worry, I'm not too concerned about this. But, um, actually I can't, no, I can't say. Anyway, the more perceptive among you would be able to tell what I'm talking about. Uh, somebody uh, once, a, a friend, left his phone on the uh, table in the Athens Tavern while we were having a few drinks and he had left it unlocked. So I went on that phone and opened up his Tinder account and swiped left on all of South Wales, no matter what they looked like, what they did, who they were, what age they were, you know, whether they had any teeth, whether they had any, you know, whether they had their own skin, because I'm sure one lady was just skin grafts. Uh, and it all worked out well. Yeah? Kind of. Didn't work out well for our friendship for a while. But, um, but I didn't have to think about that. Because I was trying to create what I thought would be funny, intimate relationships. <laughs> Just by, so it didn't even matter that it was me doing it. <coughs> you know? The same effect happened. So, it is that gesture in itself. And you know, you might be on an application where the swipe is in the thing as well. But, it is that sort of idea that it is the gesture and the unthinkingness of the gesture which has become critically important. That's what we call swipe logic. But the logic of dating apps is not to consider people as complex individuals who you may or may not like in a long-term perspective, but instead to think of them in very shallow terms, which reduces intimate relationships themselves down to shallow terms and when you finally meet or go any further with that person. It is all reduced down to points of, in of shallowness rather than depth. And this is hard baked into the very <coughs> systems that we use. So, we can think about it in terms of the profile first of all. To capture attention and stand out in social media influence dating apps, Profiles have to be differentiated from one another. So we are in Goffman's front stage, backstage territory. It does not matter what you are as a person. You could be a hideous fucking scumbag, but as long as your photo looks good, you're going to do okay. Because you're not presenting an authentic picture of yourself in any of this. So we're involved always in a process and performance of self-promotion in dating apps. Always to have the best photograph. You know, always, always be doing something which the other person will find interesting. Always be eating at a nice restaurant, because that's what you do all the time, right? Every fucking night is eat at a nice restaurant. Always be up pen a fucking van. What is it with Welsh people and pen a van? Just fucking leave it alone, right? It's a hill. It's not even that hard to walk up. It takes like, what, an hour? Tops? Has anyone been up pen a van in there? Yeah, you're scared of but um, it's not it's not like you've just scaled fucking Everest or something. Like, you know, what is the problem with people? Oh, we're pulling fucking kind of like, fuck off. Um, so, you know, now, you know, down the road from Penland is Merthyr. I'd be more impressed if somebody managed to scale, you know, go not to stay up to the hospital. That's got actual danger involved with it. You know, if, you know, if you're going to show that you're on, show it properly. So, um, we're always in a process, you know, in some kind of performative uh, way with doing these applications. So Goffman's thoughts on self-presentation, the presentation of self in everyday life, 
are incredibly valid in this context. So an extremely simple app interface codes itself as less intimidating than a face-to-face -face encounter. Because we can code our identity to fit the application and the interface, this then becomes something which is much less intimidating than having to meet people face to face. It's a much easier way of doing it. Why take the hours for you to get ready and you know, all the nerves, and, you know, you have to cut the shots because do you know what I mean? Just put the phone there. So much easier, right? So we buy into, if you like, the efficiency of it and the convenience of it. These are much more efficient and convenient ways of doing things. Images become crucial, like I talked about in lecture three. The entire modern, um, language of communication on these applications is the image. You might move beyond that once you've matched with somebody, but the initial way of communicating with somebody is all image. Now, I, I don't like the use of the word bait in this because it's got connotations which are not great, but I think it kind of works in that fashion, right? And tempting other users to connect. So users present an idealized or attractive image, not the self that is actually a factor in intimacy. Because those of you who are in intimate relationships will know this only too well, that intimacy involves not just the good things about a person, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I'll take that back. It also involves all the grubby, horrible things about a person as well, and that is what intimacy is about. It's learning about a person, and nobody is perfect, and everyone has flaws and you learn to love and make the flaws just as much as the good things, but that's how you establish intimacy with another person. This kind of interface does not, can you imagine the potential success rate of somebody, and in fact, I've got an interesting example of this, of somebody who refused to put good photos of themselves up and like put images of themselves, I don't know, at three o'clock <coughs> in the morning in a kebab shop, eating, chips, cheese, and curry sauce with makeup strewn down her face and, you know, looking like an absolute stint. How would they get on, do you think? Not very well? Well, interestingly, first year I ran this module, um, one of the students, Imogen, I don't know if this is up on campus, actually, Imogen did exactly this for her project. I think it's fair to say Imogen, very, very attractive young woman, had a lot of success on social, on dating apps, in terms of making matches with other people. So she decided to subvert it. She went out on a, like, Wednesday night to town, got absolutely slaughtered, and got her friends to take loads of photos of her when she was in a mess, including the infamous one with the curry sauce, the cheese and chips, right? Which was half down there as well. She didn't do that on purpose, it was basically just dribbling out of her mouth because she was so drunk, right? And then she put, she took all her photos down off the internet and put those photos up for a week instead to see how she got on. And we were like, I, 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 I thought this was absolutely brilliant when it was happening, right? And I, I was like, and I, she came to see me halfway through the week. She said, I don't think this is going to work. And I said, why have you broken down and put the nice photos up? He said, no, I'm getting more likes. <laughs> that I was getting before. <laughs> like, uh, we'll get into, and we got into like the reasons why that might be in the project as well, you know. But um, and in the reflective essay, but it was kind of bizarre that like somebody who was already getting a huge amount of attention was getting more attention because she was looking like a drunken wreck. Um, but she kind of subverted it. It didn't seem to have much of an issue. Um, but nevertheless. If we think about authenticity here, for the vast majority of people, there is no such thing as authenticity on such applications. We, in fact, try our hardest to be as inauthentic as possible. Now, what does that say about us as a people in the social media age? You know, this is me, but I dare not show me. I'll show a completely inauthentic version of me because that's what people will like. If people knew the real me, no one would ever get with me. Ah, that's a wider sort of issue about self-identity in the digital media age, but it's a very important one for us to understand. In an age where we can present ourselves as perfect, we try our hardest not to present ourselves as real. That is deeply, deeply problematic. And dating apps are a great 
illustration of that tendency. Um, in terms of research that's been done on this, Dugai links authenticity on Tinder to Anthony Giddens. It's that idea of keep getting right to talk about Giddens early in the module. I said the importance of social media was in keeping a coherent narrative of our lives together, the way that we document ourselves on it. Um, what Dugai says is that dating apps actually subvert that. <coughs> that we are not keeping an accurate portrayal of ourselves. In fact, we're subverting that and affecting the way that we actually think about our bio uh, biographical narrative by trying to fit into something else. So we're not authentic in that way. We're actually creating something quite inauthentic instead, which is problematic for us. The amount of hideous behaviour that this encourages between sentient human beings is deeply problematic. So research that has been done on this uh, March's research on trolling. Troll, uh, trolling behaviours on Tinder were associated highly with people who had high scores on psychopathy and sadism. So it did research on people who engage as trolls on uh, Tinder, for example, and saw that they were high on those scales. And psychopath uh, psychopathy moderates relationships between dysfunctional impulsivity and trolling. I mean, I talk about the trolling one here, but the amount of research that has been done by uh, female scholars in particular about the sharing of pictures of male anatomy on these applications is phenomenal. And my only thing to say about that is why? Why would you do that? What is the matter with you? You know, that isn't even something attractive, what's going on. Um, and But this is like a absolutely it's like a foundational thing of dating apps. It's like, I can't imagine being a woman out here to date that. It must be absolutely hideous. It must be terrible. I um, follow a few accounts on uh, Twitter that details on this, where people send in screenshots of the things. So the one I follow, like um, incel pickup lines, for example, where people, <laughs> people send the correspondence they have with other people on dating that, and it's like, the fuck is going on? What has happened to society? How are these people allowed to have a phone? Let alone all the other stuff and communicate with other people. But of course, it's normal. And the absolute removal of the normative behaviours that we use to establish intimacy to replace them with an interface where you can behave in a relatively anonymous way as well. You know, you may well have a profile picture, etc. It's not. It might not be your name. It might not be your age. It might not be your area. It's easy enough to gain the area on these applications. I mean, in one level, you can think of it in terms of how many married men are on this. Well, there's loads. How many men in relationships with other women on there? Tons. That accounts for some of the imbalance between female and male users like right that. But on a deeper level, these sort of things these sort of applications allow people to behave in a feral way because if intimate relationships were established in a social community in a social connected way then behaving hideously towards women would have repercussions you know if you were in a bar and you i only remember this too well you know you'd always back in the day you'd have some pissed up idiot right would be going around grabbing women trying to get them to dance whatever Eventually, you get filled in. Eventually, somebody just break and snap. And I, I, a couple of times, it was me. It was the person who broke the snap and sent it back to him. It's just me going along with him. There's no people watching. There's no people watching. And the app is not watching. Yeah. And you can report people for bad behavior. What's the worst that happened? The account gets deleted, they're back on it for five minutes. Just a new account. So you can do it again. Because the app is only interested on how much data is being produced, how much advertising is being brought in for it. So, catfishing and trolling is one aspect of the hideousness that these applications have allowed people to express. And it really, really is problematic. Intimacy itself, if this is the primary mode for, of establishing intimacy for a lot of people, what must people think about intimacy? So, do you want to be intimate with these people? 
Now, gestures such as pinching, dragging, scrolling, zapping, and clicking foster connections primarily using images. And users sim seamlessly immerse themselves in mediated or presumed intimacy thanks to this touch gesture environment that we're in. This then becomes an extension of what we call the quantified self. This entire swipe gesture interface allows a whole bunch of statistics to come together. And in a wider society where we are quantified constantly, that becomes really problematic for our esteem. How many people count? Well, you don't count yourself. But how many people um, look at how many steps they've done in a day? Now, I do it because a couple of years ago, I think it was before you guys started, I had to have my knee replaced. So I was off the road for like three months. So it's really important to me that I do a minimum of seven and a half thousand steps a day. Because if I do less, my knee's going to get weak. Then I'm going to get back in hospital with my knee, right? Which I don't want to do because it took a kilometer for last time. So, I'm part of this sort of quantified self environment. It seems like quite a few other people are as well. Everything in the social media world is part of the quantified self. How many likes we get for our posts, how many comments are made, how many impressions we make for a post, for example. I'm sure some of you are going to get into this in the project as well. It's usually a really good way of looking at how social media affects you. Now, that quantified self works in two ways. According to Deborah Lupton, who came up with the concept in 2016, we not only rely on the quantifications to understand, understand ourselves as individuals, but also we are constantly quantified. The things that we do, the things that we are, the information that we provide is all part of the quantification of us. And dating apps are critically important aspect of that quantification because they tell data aggregators and that data profile that is made of you things that other applications can't do. Like, what are you looking for in a partner? What are the things that you like? What do you find attractive in another person? Those are not so easily understood on others. Therefore, they are a critically important point in this quantification of society. They quantify things which aren't apparent in other ways. Now, for Nancy Bain, all of this has become normalized. And the reason why it's become normalized, and again, Nancy's not necessarily super anti this, but what Nancy Bain says in her book, Connections of the Digital Age, is there's a real positive as people see dating applications. Not necessarily in how they work, but in how people perceive them, in that it reduces uncertainty. Now let's go back to the scenario earlier, meeting somebody at a bar. What do you know about that person? What are that thinking? <laughs> That's a brilliant answer. What are they drinking? <laughs> Stella, I'm fucking going anywhere near him. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, you can tell a lot by what somebody's drinking as well, to be fair. Um, somebody's like necking Jaeger bombs, and they're probably not for me, like, you know. But yeah, um, so, yeah, okay, you could. What, what else might you know about them? You have more time when you leave the bar, and you have more time go back and go. Forget about when you leave the bar. The point at which you meet. What might you know about them? What kind of thing? Right, the possibility of nothing. Right? What, what kind so, of live on that, on that basis, would you go and chat with a stranger at the bar? No. Good for you. I'm proud of you. Um, Bain's point is that that scenario doesn't need to happen on dating app because, in principle, we will know something about the person on the basis of their profile. My point about that is, you don't know if that's fucking fiction. This person could be Charles Dickens, right? Writing a complete novel about themselves and they've done nothing to do with who they are. It's a risk that we take, but at least it's more information than meeting somebody who you have no context with whatsoever. Can you even watch him one day? Yeah, you seen that program on Netflix? That would never happen. 
You would never just go up to somebody at like a ball and just tap off them. What's going on? You would want to know something about them, sure. But, or am I completely out of it? I don't know. It's just like, just walk up to some random and just start. I thought they were doing completely different courses. Yeah, she thought he was a shagger and not. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> I was, I, there, was a, there was a little bit about it. I was like, why would she go with him? And in the first episode, I was like, what's going on here? Like, you know, uh, it wasn't so much a point that he, he was like, what? She's singing him. But, yeah, okay. Pretty boy, I guess. Um, anyway, yeah, fictional story, so I'm not going to dwell on it for too long. But, um, what Nancy Bay argues is that there is a perception that dating apps produce uncertainty, or at least a perception of uncertainty. So we could look at people who've got common interests, you can have focused communications with somebody before you meet them, so you can reduce the anxiety and the uncertainty that you might have from, the, from um, meeting a stranger. That would lower the social risk of communication with somebody. However, it is still based on appearance, and what I mean by appearance here is not just a physical appearance that somebody is constructing, that presentation of self in everyday life uh, here again, that front stage, we construct an appearance in terms of, you know, you might start talking to somebody on a date now, yeah, I'm really into sort of 90s folk rock music, and I'm there like, yeah, okay, that's my that's my shit right there, yeah, you're into the pumpkins, you're into the pearl jam, I love it, and it's like, she's never good, because it's just a construction, right, you know, so that can happen. So, but I think, that's not to say I disagree with Nancy Bain's point entirely. I get why she's saying that, and I understand from a perceptual perspective why that works. And then, then that leads me to understand better I think, why people have persisted with dating apps. Now, there seems to be a backlash at the moment against them, that people are saying, I'm using them less. But that's not necessarily borne out in a huge reduction of usage. Dating apps companies are reporting that they're getting less revenue, but every digital media company is reporting that as well. It's, it doesn't necessarily filter through that these are disappearing. So, what do we have? Dating apps are a natural extension of social media. We present ourselves via social media, we do things via social media, we connect with others. Why not connect with intimate people, with people we want to be intimate with? Sharing many of the same features or be deeply integrated in existing social media. Therefore, pretty much all the same value for criticisms apply. But I think there are additional ones in terms of how transformation of intimacy as a concept has occurred. I think that's really problematic. And how this, that swipe logic has transformed our very understanding of what it is to appreciate another person. That's also very important. And there we can finish. I did promise it would only be half lecture. I keep my promises, people. I should put that on the fucking thing. Yeah. <laughs>